Hey, raise your hand high if you do not have four glasses to taste from. Look, everybody look around. Everybody look around. We've got several people without glasses, and if there are any mats left over, we'll get you a mat. So tasting glasses to the people with the hands up. You old ones in the back, keep them up long. That's you, Chris. Keep your hands up. So, hey, ladies, let's go ahead and pour. Let's pour that first one when you get a shot. Okay, everybody, y'all ready? I always tried to sit by you in high school to cheat off of you. That's why I graduated with a 2.3. Okay, here we go. Let's get started, everybody. So let me have your attention. Everybody's having fun. We want you to have a great time, but do your best. The more you start to have a couple of sips, the more you're going to want to talk, and that's, that's all great, right? But just be aware we have a guest speaker here, Miss Jacqueline Evans from Maker's Mark, and we want to be very respectful of her. So have fun, talk to your neighbors, but every now and then I may wave to you because it gets really loud in here. So first of all, thanks for coming out. We really appreciate it. This is the Big Bourbon Club for those of you who don't know who we are, what we do. Cress and I, Cress, stand up, raise your hand real quick. Look in the back here. Cress, Cress Bride. Cress is our proprietor. He owns Joe's Older Than Dirt, and he is my partner in the Big Bourbon Club. And we started this thing back in November of 21. And we did it because we really, truly wanted to create a club to make bourbon more fun for everybody, not just for some of us. We've tried to create, and on our website, we want to create the most inclusive bourbon club in the world, and we're doing that. So we've been around for a year and three months. We started from scratch. Crest said we'd probably get 25 members. I said 35. Today we have 3,750 members. 3,750. Now, maybe what you don't know is most of our members don't live in Kentucky. They live in five countries, and they live across America. And so the heartbeat of our club is the app, the Big Bourbon Club app. And every day we get, on average, 400 engagements a day on the app. 400 times a day, one of you get on the app and post a picture, post a comment, respond to a comment. This thing is exploding. Three weeks ago, we had our first distillery event, so once a month at Joe's, we host a distillery or a brand to present to the Big Bourbon Club. Three weeks ago, we had Watershed Distillery out of Columbus kick off the 2022 season. We had 120 people here on a Saturday, and we had 3,520 members. Today, we have 200 more members in three weeks. It's growing fast, so we're doing something right. Um, we appreciate you all coming out. There are a couple of different members, membership levels of the Big Bourbon Club. The number one level is the top shelf, and it's 125 a year. And if you compare that to a lot of other bourbon clubs, it's probably on average half price. But for 125 a year, you get all of these events here in Louisville, all of these tastings. You don't pay a penny. You come for free. It's paid for out of the 125. 
if you're a free member, because we have free members, and if, we, if you want to join us free, that's fine too, you're going to pay 45 bucks for the event. So if you come to four events or three events, you run the math. It pays for itself very quickly. The other cool thing about Top Shelf is, to me, the best thing about it is we're doing barrel picks every month. There's four of them up there now that are for sale. Uh, we're releasing the Maker's Mark officially tonight, even though we released it about two weeks ago. But if you want a barrel pick, if you're a Top Shelf member, you're first in line. It's like a fast pass at Disney World. You don't have to wait. And if you're a free member, you may not even get one. So depending upon the pick, that's another reason to join Top Shelf. So go to BigBourbonClub.com. That's our website. Join at whatever level you want. We're really glad you're here. Um, I'm going to call Hilda. Hilda, come on up here. So we truly, we truly are creating a very inclusive club. We have a women's subgroup of the Big Bourbon Club. We've got people all over that look very different than me. And I met Hilda last week or a couple weeks ago at the Watershed event. I've never seen her in my life. And tell them what you said to me when you came. Hi, I'm Hilda. I said thank you um, for inviting me and having me here. I I did the free uh, membership. I paid the $45, and I remember looking at James going, it's going to be a bunch of white guys here and me. And <laughs> she did not say that. She said it's going to be a bunch of old white guys here. There's some younger, but yes, I did say old, middle-aged, white guys, and me. And it just feels, you know, kind of uninviting. I don't really fit in. And he's like, no, 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 you should come. It's going to be a great time. And I did. And I ended up meeting tons of women, realizing I'm not alone, that there are inclusivity. I felt part of the group. I see people. People have reached out to me since that day saying, we loved, you know, to – befriend you we'd love for you to join our team um i just felt so welcome and so ever since then i just i paid my dues and i became a top shelf member right after that so so thank you if you walk any closer to me you're gonna have to speak in the microphone <laughs> hilda thank you for that thanks for coming up uh no we don't want your jokes go on keep going that way that way I was just teasing you. Um, I've got some good jokes, too. We will do, maybe do, do that after a couple of drinks. So let me tell you what we're doing. So last year was our first year. We had nine different distillery events live, one a month. This year we've already booked. Last year we had ten. This year we've already booked nine. So we started in March of COVID year, March of 21. Yellowstone came out. And we've had them every month since then, other than Christmas and other than January. So if you go to the Big Bourbon Club website and you look at the event schedule, next month we have Luxro coming out and we have our uh, Ezra Brooks pick that's being released. In May we have Peerless coming out and we have a Double Oak Rye being released. Uh, we have Marble Distilling out of Carbondale, Colorado. You probably don't know them. You need to know them, but we went out and purchased a barrel from them back in September. They're going to release their first ever bourbon in Kentucky in June. It is incredible. It doesn't taste like Maker's Mark. It doesn't taste like Kentucky whiskey, and it's not supposed to, but it is incredibly good. So come on out in June uh, to see Marble. In August, Angel's Envy comes out, and Wes Henderson, who's a great buddy of Crest and mine and a lot of you all, even though he's retired, he's going to come and present to us in August. Old Carter will be here in September. Horse Soldier will come in October. And we have our good friends at Jim Beam coming in November. Uh, a one-year anniversary from last November when Knob Creek came and presented. So we have an incredible lineup. We're working on next year already. We've got barrel picks coming up, and we'll tell you about all of them. The Big Bourbon Club is doing some cool stuff. We hope to have 5,000 members at the end of the year, 10,000 at the end of the next year, and I, th I really think we will. So with no further ado, thanks for coming out. Let me introduce our guests, the reason we're here, and I just wanted to say one thing. I mean, Maker's Mark, without a doubt, is one of the most iconic brands in the world, not just in bourbon, but in the world. It really is, right? You see the red wax, you know exactly what it is. Maker's Mark has been around since the 50s. It's one of the great brands of all time. A, a lot of you know this story, but many, many years ago in the late 90s, Bill Samuels was my boss. They were tough years, I'll say. But he was my board chairman for two years in a row, and he used to give me a bottle two or three times a year and sign it to me and Actually, Connor and his brother Caleb have all these bottles now, but Maker's Mark has been the only bourbon on my shelf 
for years and years and years, and you all too. We all know makers, and we're so excited about Jacqueline Evans coming out here to present to us. So we've got four great expressions, and I'm going to turn over to Jacqueline. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Joe's Older Than Dirt. I'm so honored to be here with the Big Bourbon Club. Um, so, yeah, you all ready to drink some whiskey tonight? Yeah. Heck, yeah. Well, let's get this started off. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of Maker's Mark. But uh, first and foremost, again, as he said, my name is Jacqueline. Um, I've been with Maker's Mark Distillery for 10 years now, and I've done a lot with the company in my time. Uh, started off giving tours part-time, uh, then I ran the tour department, and then I became a diplomat, and I went out into the world to speak makers. Um, and then I came back home and ran our private barrel program. So I'm really excited to introduce you to the Big Bourbon Club's um, private selection tonight. But as Steve already mentioned, Maker's Mark was established back in 1953. It was two people, Bill Samuels Sr. and his wife, Margie Samuels. Okay? Now, the Samuels family, they were no stranger to the bourbon industry prior to Maker's Mark. They ran a family distillery called the T.W. Samuels Distillery for over 100 years. And according to our founder's son, they made some pretty shitty whiskey. <laughs> uh, but if you think back uh, and go back to the 1940s, think in your head, um, bourbon wasn't quite the connoisseur's drink that it is today. You didn't have giant clubs going around talking about bourbon. Um, so the focus wasn't so much on a flavor as it was effect. So uh, Bill Samuel Sr., he was at the helm of his family distillery in the early 1940s when he seized an opportunity to sell that family business he sold that distillery he got out of the business altogether for about 10 years turns out he was a horrible businessman uh, tried his hand and failed several times opening other businesses uh, a bank a car lot fail fail um, but at this point in his life he's really in retirement mode uh, he'd sold the distillery, he had plenty of money, and at this point, he's just hanging around the house, driving his wife nuts. And one day, she finally says, you need to get out of my face, and you need to go get a hobby. And the only thing that you're really good at is making whiskey. So um, he'd always had this dream in his mind that he would bring connoisseurship to the whiskey industry that he could create a bourbon that people didn't have to learn how uh, to, their taste buds didn't have to learn how to like it, right? Now, I always use this example. How many of you all are coffee drinkers? Okay. Keep your hand up if you put, if you like your coffee black, keep your hand up, all right? Put it down, all right? If you like cream in your coffee, put it up. Cream and sugar. Oh, those are the few people that love themselves. We'll get along really well. Um, so I don't know if you all are like me, but I remember my first experience drinking coffee. I was about six years old. My dad, he was an old army guy. You know, he always had a, a, a pot of black coffee every single morning. And I was just dying to try it, you know. Never would, no, you don't need this. Wait till you get older. Well, one day he got up. And of course, I snuck myself a little sip. And I immediately spit it out. And I was like, how do people do this? Why do grown-ups drink this? Because it tasted horrible. It was bitter. It was disgusting. Flash forward to about mm, my early 20s, and Starbucks starts making those milkshakes they call coffee. And I start drinking, and I'm thinking I'm so sophisticated. Ooh, I'm a coffee drinker now. 95% sugar. Um, so then I got a little bit more conscious about what I was putting in my body, and I took, you know, started taking out the cream, started taking out the sugar. And eventually, I trained my taste buds to be okay with the bitterness of black coffee. But my instinct was not to like it. 
And that's what he wanted to do when he set out to create Maker's Mark. He didn't want you to have to train your taste buds to like his whiskey. So after 10 years out of the industry, our founders, they find this little rundown distillery out in the middle of nowhere, or as I call it, Loretto, Kentucky. How many of y'all been to the distillery? Oh yeah, if you haven't, consider this your personal invite. Um, but this is little tiny distillery out in the middle of nowhere, and he buys it for a cool $35,000. It's about 250 acres. And the reason he wants it isn't because there's a shell of a distillery already there. It's because of the water source that we have out there in Loretto. And we're very fortunate um, that I can stand here in front of you today and be super transparent when I say every drop of Maker's Mark starts from that single source of water, our lake up at the top of the hill. And I don't know if y'all have heard about this, but just recently we became B Corp certified. Woohoo! The first in bourbon country to achieve that um, level, that certification. And not only do we own our water source, but we own the watershed that surrounds it. Um, that means that we can control what goes into that um, to make sure that we always have the best raw resources there to make our whiskey with. So he buys this new distillery and he sets out with a very specific goal in mind. He wants to create something that is smooth, balanced, and without bitterness. And if you don't go away home with anything tonight other than this, know that it is easy to make a bitter bourbon. It is hard to keep bitterness out. A lot of times people go, oh, Maker's Mark, you're just too sweet. Maker's Mark, oh, it's, just, it's a sweet bourbon. I assure you we do not pour sugar in our barrels, but we work our asses off to make sure that you don't have to deal with the bitterness. So that you don't have to mix a bunch of sugar to enjoy I think I'll just, oh, sorry, technology is not my thing. I think when you said ass, the whole <laughs> system shut down. It's never heard that before. <laughs> so, sets out this vision. Now, everything that we do at the distillery, you know, almost 70 years on now, is still to achieve that one goal, is to create that type of bourbon. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that today of all days, March 8th, is International Women's Day. And let me tell you, behind every good man is an even better woman. And her name was Margie Samuels. And she is the reason that you probably know Maker's Mark today. Because we always joke, we say you buy your first bottle because of Margie, you buy your second bottle because of Bill. Because while Bill was hard at work perfecting that flavor profile so he could show off to his friends how he can make such a good, smooth, tasty bourbon, she was hard at work designing the marketing behind it. Because when it came time to bottle up that first batch of Maker's Mark, he had no clue what he was even going to call this stuff. And she said, listen, you can't put Samuels on there because people will associate it with that crap y'all used to make. Let's call it something completely different. And she collected fine English pewter pieces. And like most people do, she drew inspiration from what was around her. And on the bottoms of the best pieces, it's always the mark of the maker. She said, let's call it Maker's Mark. So that's where our name came to be. And on every bottle and everything that you see, you're going to see this mark. It's an S, I, V with a circle and star. The S stands for Samuels, their family name. The I, V is the Roman numeral four for fourth generation commercial distiller, which is what her husband was. And the circle and star, that represents Star Hill Farm. That was their farm in Bardstown, Kentucky. It is now the name that we have adopted for the farmland that surrounds our distillery today. So it was her idea to dip it in the red wax, too. In fact, uh, there was a lot of contention there. Um, she collected 19th century um, cognac bottles, and they were always dipped in wax. She thought that was cool. So when she was playing around with the prototype bottles, she melted some red wax, she dipped it. And what she wasn't expecting is that it dripped. 
And she was like, you know, I kind of like that. So she showed her husband one night over dinner. She said, see this? This is what we're going to do with every single bottle. And he looked at her and he said, absolutely not. You are crazy. You never call a woman crazy. From that day forward, every bottle was hand-dipped, and it still is hand-dipped today. And dare I say, we have Margie Samuels to thank for that iconic brand that Maker's Mark is today. So uh, strong women make good bourbon, so just know that. Um, a, a few other things I want to note uh, for you all when you're hosting tastings at home or if you're at the bar and you just want to spread some knowledge. She was a very particular woman. Uh, she, in this indentation that you see at the base of the neck of the bottle here, that is there on purpose. She insisted that when you pour a bottle of Maker's Mark, that you hear glug, glug, glug. And that indentation is why you hear it. So that is why that bottle is shaped like that. Not only that, but at the time, I think this is the early 1950s, most bottles were shaped like a cylinder. She wanted that bottle to stand out. She wanted it to look like an expensive decanter. That's why it's squared off. So pretty strong woman there. So now, speaking of strong women, we're going to try some strong whiskey now. Our first thing that we're going to try is a little bit of cask strength maker's mark. Now, cask strength um, is, cask is just another word for barrel, okay? Uh, it varies in strength depending on the batch. It can come out anywhere from 108 to 114. That tends to be our, our kind of range there. Now, we enter the barrel at 110. Um, so 108 to 114, usually about 110 is what you're going to get. For those of you who are here tonight, you've got 110.8 proof in your cask strength. Now, a little story about this cask strength whiskey. I started Maker's Mark April 2012, and it was a really hot April. I remember that because when you start at Maker's Mark, they don't just give you a badge and let you give you a book and let you start talking to people about makers. Oh, no, no, no. You got to work. You got to roll barrels up at the top of the warehouse and 100 degrees. You got to dip bottles on the line. You got you to gotta drop the grains into the cooker. You got to do it all. But the best day was on my third day. I was in Regage, and Regage is where they dump the barrels. They just got the barrels in from the warehouse. They're ready to bottle them. So I'm standing there, and there's all these big burly warehouse guys around me watching me do my work, making sure I don't kill myself. <coughs> and I'm drilling the bungs out tipping over the barrels and the whiskey's coming out of the trough well I guess I was just mesmerized they said I just kind of stood there like a deer in headlights and I remember that smell of whiskey straight out of the barrels something I never really smelled before and just the look of it and I was just so thirsty and then I hear and then I feel tap 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 on my shoulder and there's one of the guys and he's just kind of looking at me and he's holding out a little cup and I looked at him, and I looked at that barrel, and I said, are you shitting me right now? Is this some sort of test? Am I going to get fired for doing this? Because I really don't care. And I grabbed that cup out of his hand, and I stuck it underneath there, and I got me the biggest swig of whiskey you ever tasted, and it ruined my life. <laughs> because whiskey, maker's mark straight out the barrel, is pretty damn good. So what we're going to do, we're going to try that together tonight. Fast forward a couple years later, here I thought it was my secret, and then we released it to everybody. We're going to nose this together. <sighs> How's that smell? Smell good? You know, I've done a lot of tastings over the last 10 years, and I'll, I'm, I, like to, I, like, I like when people talk with me, and I'll ask questions. How's it smell? What do you smell? What does it taste like? And here's a little secret. There's no wrong answer, okay? What you smell is what you smell. What you taste is what you taste. They're tied to your unique memory and sensory pathways. So if anyone ever tells you you're wrong, they're an asshole, all right? So, cheers. Woo, 
I swirl that around, hit all those taste buds. How's it taste? Delicious, right? Does it taste like 110 proof? Goes down smooth, doesn't it? Yeah. And hopefully you're experiencing that flavor towards the front half of your tongue. Because one thing that our founder despised was bitterness. He didn't want you to have that punch in the back of the throat. All right, one down, three to go, right? Whew. That's the way to start. Let me, uh, hey, Jacqueline, any questions out in the audience for Jacqueline? We got one in the back. So our barrels are made out of new American oak barrels. Yes. Uh, we're a number three char, or as I call it, the belly of the alligator. What, what other questions do you have? Any other questions? Jack. Yes, sir. No, sir. Nope. Yes, sir. <laughs> So Jack over here, if y'all didn't hear, he was asking if Makers is a weeded bourbon. Absolutely it is. And yes, it is the best weeded bourbon, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> that's right. So we're 70% corn, 16% soft red winter wheat, and 14% malted barley. And it's, I'm glad you brought that up, Jack, because that's another thing I'm very proud of. For those of you who have been to our distillery and for those of you who are coming to the distillery, I'm looking at her, um, when you drive through, you'll notice that we are surrounded by farmland, which is really good if you're a distillery because that means we can get most of our grains locally. In fact, our corn comes from farms within a 60-mile radius of our distillery. Our soft red renter wheat comes from Peterson Farms just down the road, about 10 minutes down the road. Now, the malted barley, we don't get that locally. Um, that's not a widely grown um, grain here in Kentucky yet, so we'll get that from the upper Midwest states. Mike Davis. That's a great question. I get asked that quite a bit. And in fact, I got asked so many times. I finally, I just called Bill up one day. Hey, Jacqueline, re repeat the question oh, for yes. me, please. Yeah. Uh, the question was, is, you know, uh, when Maker's Mark was starting up, there's a lot of stories out there about how we partnered up with other folks in the industry, Stitzel Weller, those folks, anyone else in the industry um, to help get a start up. I think you mentioned yeast strains and things like that. Um, the truth is 100%. Um, I spoke to Bill Jr. about this probably a year ago because the question kept coming up about the yeast strain. And uh, he said, you know, my dad was friends with a lot of people in the business. And they, you know, bourbon is such a tight-knit community. A lot of them were related to each other. Um, and they would trade things all the time, resources. Um, and he said, I do know that my dad was given several strains of yeast to experiment with whenever he started up Maker's Mark. But the truth is, no one knows. No one knows which yeast strain they ended up going up, going, going with. But I can tell you this is the same yeast strain that we use today. So, um, yeah. In fact, we were just talking about this earlier. My colleague over here, Mike Beam, uh, what was it, your great, great, great uncle. uncle was our first master distiller, Elmo Bean. And my guess is that that yeast strain was chosen by him, more than likely. So, good question. Anyone else? So, are we pouring the second now? Okay. And raise your hand if you don't have it yet. So, we're getting close where we can taste okay. the second expression. Uh, I do have a question from Facebook Live, though. Sure. Uh, how many stills do you operate, and how big are they? So we operate three stills. They are five stories tall, 36 inches diameter. Are they Vendome? They are indeed. They are Vendome, and they are 100% copper. 
Is anybody in here the great, great granddaughter of Elmore Sherman, the founder of Vendome Copper? If you are, stand up, Suzanne. <laughs> Suzanne, stand up. My wife, her great granddaddy started Vendome. That's awesome. I have so many questions. <laughs> Why the name Vendome? <laughs> That's awesome. We love Vendome. <laughs> All right, we're getting ready to taste the second one. So let me ask you a quick question. The first, the cast strength, what was the proof? 110? 110.8. What flavor profiles did you get out of there? Pepper, caramel. Pepper, caramel. Brown, sugar. Brown sugar. Cherry. Cherry. Yeah. Cinnamon? Cinnamon, yeah. Coffee? W was it hot on the finish for anybody? I didn't get it. I thought it was very smooth on the finish. Did, yeah. ra raise your hand if you liked it a lot, for real. Okay, so we're gonna do a, we're gonna do a vote at the very end of this of which one is our favorite. Okay, bit. that was a great one. Yeah. All right, you want to lead us into I mean, number two? You are what you are when you come out of the barrel. So uh, you come out strong like that. So that leads me to this. So you know, Makers has been in business for over fifty three years, and for I'm sorry, since nineteen fifty three. And between 1953 and th 2010, we only made, well, we still only make one thing. We really only make one bourbon, and we're very proud of that. Um, we have one mash bill, we have one yeast strain, we have one process that we use, and everything starts off as that cash strength maker's mark that you just drank. Now, what we'll do is we'll take that cast strength and we'll finish it in unique ways to derive these other expressions of it. And that leads me to Makers 46, which is our next uh, thing on our taste mat here. So Makers 46, this was launched in 2010. And as I said before, for over 50 years, we had the one product. It was Bill and Margie's perfect version of whiskey, Makers Mark 90 proof, delicious. And their son, Bill Samuels Jr., he took over running the company in the early 1970s. And some of you all, I know Steve knows him, but some of you all probably know Bill or have met Bill um, in your travels or living here in Louisville. And he was the one that really put bourbon, in my opinion, on the map. Uh, not just Maker's Mark. He went out into the world as a whiskey ambassador and basically told everyone what we were doing here in Kentucky and this delicious bourbon that we were making because at the time, you know, scotch was king, right? So prior to him coming along, we were pretty much only distributed in Kentucky and Tennessee. And thankfully for him, he got us started with some advertising and word of mouth and now we are a global brand that is sold in 50 different countries. Um, but before he retired in 2010 at 70 years old, he said, you know what? I spent my entire career making my mom and dad's whiskey famous. I should probably do something of my own. So he did exactly what his father did in the early 1950s. And he started off with a flavor vision. Basically, he called the team together, including the master distiller at the time, and sat him down. He had this whiteboard out, and he writes out three things. The first thing he writes is the word yummy. Okay, Bill, what the hell does yummy mean? That's pretty subjective, right? Well, then the next thing he writes is makers on steroids. And finally, everybody's like, can you elaborate just a little bit here? He said, well, you know, I just want to take the flavors of Maker's Mark, and I just want to amplify them. And we're like, okay. And then last but not least, he said, long finish, no bitter aftertaste. He wanted to draw out the finish of Maker's Mark on the palate, but still without that bitter aftertaste. So he said, okay, that's what you got to do. Get to work. Oh, and by the way, you can't change the mash bill. You can't change the yeast. You can't change the process. Now, this is 2010. So they thought about it for a little while. And luckily for us, 
Our Cooperage Independent Stave Company is just down the road in Lebanon, Kentucky, about 15 minutes from our distillery. And they said, let's go talk to them and see what we can do with this barrel. So now secondary aging processes or double barreling is pretty common in the bourbon industry nowadays. But in 2010, this was a novel idea. And the thing about Independent Stave is they make barrels for people all over the world. And they have an entire arm of their company dedicated to winemakers, to vintners. They've been doing this for centuries. They've been using wood to manipulate flavors in wine. And I thought, well, you know, I wonder if this could work with bourbon. So we did a lot of experimentation. And what we landed on is this process called the Maker's 46 process. Um, and it's pretty labor intensive, as is everything we do at the distillery. What we do to make Maker's 46 is we start off with a barrel of cast strength Maker's Mark, which you just drank. And instead of bottling that barrel, we're going to take it to our coopering area. We're going to dump its contents momentarily into a stainless steel tank. Then our warehouse team is going to take that empty barrel. They're going to cooper it. They're going to take the top two rings off, take the head of that barrel off. And they insert 10 pieces of seared French oak. French oak, very different than American oak and what extractives you're going to get. But this wood has been cooked in an infrared oven. So I want you to imagine a giant pizza oven, okay? Just searing the outside layer, caramelizing those outside wood sugars, locking in those extra tannins that you get from that French oak. They'll stick those 10 pieces of wood in that barrel, put the barrel back together, fill it right back up with the cast strength that just took out of it, and then they're going to roll it into our cellar, which is 50 degrees or lower year-round, and let it sit there and finish for nine weeks. And in nine weeks, you get a bigger, bolder version of Maker's Mark with a longer finish and no bitter aftertaste. So, Jacqueline, can I ask a question? So the cellar's 50 degrees year-round. What do we think that does to the, in that nine weeks to the flavor? It really amplifies the caramel, the vanilla, and the baking spice notes. It also helps draw out the, the finish on that whiskey. And it's funny you ask that because we tested it out in the summertime. We tested it out at 10 weeks, at eight weeks, all these different things. And it's amazing how at 50 degrees and nine weeks is just the perfect combination for that flavor profile that Bill Jr. was looking for. So the best way to experience it is to try it for yourself. So let's do this real quick. Let's nose this one. I call it the wine drinker's bourbon. Woo, keep spilling it. All right. Cheers, everybody. Mm. Is it true that women have more olfactory glands than men? And is that why they call you nosy? That's from <laughs> Facebook. I didn't make that up. Good joke. Thank you very much. We are better tasters. No one even bit on that. <laughs> Come on. Dad joke. There are a lot of women on our taste panel, I can tell you that much. <laughs> Ooh, that was good. So, again, let's go back to his goals here. Makers on steroid, amplified baking spice notes, amplified caramel, amplified uh, vanilla. But the cool thing about 46 is the magic of the finish. I didn't do this with you all, but next time you're at home, if you're hosting uh, your own little tasting event, when you take a sip to that 46, I want you to get real weird, okay? I want you to close your eyes, and I really want you to concentrate on your palate because it does something that I've never experienced with another whiskey before. What it does on the palate, it kind of starts the back half of the tongue, kind of mid-range, but you can almost count to six seconds in your head, and you can feel that flavor just moving forward on your palate. It finishes forward which I think is weird and wonderful. Most whiskey starts at the front and finishes the back. Jacqueline, quick question from uh, Eric Woosley on Facebook Live. Why do you spell it whiskey without an E? Ooh, I love this question. 
I love it. He's, right? a, he's an aerospace engineer. He does a lot of things kind of weird. Come here. Rachel, come here. I'm, I'm going to bring up my colleague to help me with this one. Everybody, this is Rachel Soto. She works for Makers, and she's uh, flown in to Kentucky this week. So, Rachel, who said to E or not to E? Margie Samuel. That's right, folks. Margie Samuels. To E or not to E? That is the question. Did she say it like that? And the choice was not to E. And why? Why did we not E? I can tell you the answer to that question is because the Samuels family uh, came from Scottish heritage and created our whiskey in the Scottish tradition. Oh, it, does that mean it was the English tradition with the E, correct? Yes. So typical American way and Irish way is with the E, Scottish way is without the E. Good job, Rachel. <laughs> so what you what'd you all think of the 46? What did you get out of uh, what'd you get off that? Bolder flavor, longer finish. It's, it's definitely lingering around on that palate a little bit longer. It's amazing what 10 pieces of wood in nine weeks will do. Yeah. Jacqueline, we have stuff. another question. How sure. many Rick houses do you all have in Kentucky? We have in, uh, so all of our Rick houses are in Kentucky, and we have 45 of them. Are they all six-story? No. No, we've got some three-story. We've got some seven-story. Yeah. Our oldest one is Warehouse A, and it is a whopping three stories. We've grown. Yes, sir. How many barrels per Rick House? Uh, that's a great question. So, again, that varies over the years of, as we've grown. Our Rick Houses have gotten bigger. So, for example, uh, the ones on the top of the hill, if you come to the distillery and you look up, you'll see some are surrounding our lake. They'll hold about 15,000 barrels. But if you go to downtown Loretto and see some of our newer ones, you're looking at about 55,000 per yeah, they, so, a lot of liquid. So follow-up question out of Alex Cowling from the rich side of Little Rock, Arkansas. How many barrels does Makers fill a year? Oh, oh that's a great question, and the answer is I don't know. Um, the truth is, is I usually count in cases, and we're at about, we did 2.2 million cases last year, and we're on track to do upwards to 3 million this year. So if you're good at math, you can work backwards. I'm not. Non-leader non cases. Yep. It's a lot of whiskey. Y'all are thirsty. Yes, ma'am. How? Oh, that's a great question. How much is shipped overseas? Honestly, don't know. I know it's a very small percentage. Um, compared to what's kept domestically. All right. So y'all like that 46? Oh, yeah. That's good stuff. All right. So our next one here, this one's kind of a unique one in that, do I have the bottle? Is that the bottle for it? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Ah, oh, who needs a lid? Um, <laughs> saw what you did there. You didn't see that. <laughs> so this one I, I brought from our private select lab today. So this is not something you can buy. Um, but I wanted to bring something special to share with you all, um, especially to pay homage to your private select tonight. And the thing about private select, so in order to understand private select, you kind of have to understand Makers 46 and that wood finishing process. Um, so in 2015, Rob Samuels said, you know what? I really want to invite our closest friends and partners to do exactly what my dad did when he made his perfect version of Makers Mark and he made Makers 46 using um, oak staves. So we went back to Independence State and we said, okay, we know what this piece of wood, the Maker's 46 Stave does when it's combined with our whiskey. 
could we drive flavor into all these other interesting areas? For example, there's all these nuanced flavors that live in Maker's Mark, and it's just about getting them amplified a little bit. So everyone's aware of kind of your sweeter notes, your vanilla, your caramel, your brown sugar. There's also spice notes, baking spice, cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice, clove. Um, you've got your deeper, darker, richer flavors as well, chocolate and coffee, um, tobacco notes. So you have all these wonderful flavors that live in Maker's Mark, and it's how, how do we amplify those? So Independence Day, we work very closely with them, and what we decided on is we identified five different pieces of wood. Each one of them cooked in unique ways. So one American oak, four French oak, and each one of them cooked uniquely and designed to amplify very specific flavors. For example, the Baked American Pure 2 Stave. That's what it's called, the P2 Stave. Um, this is American oak. It has been baked in an oven at a low temperature for a long period of time. And who would have thunk that when you take American oak and you bake it for a long period of time at a low temperature and you combine it with Maker's Mark, you really amplify those sweet honey notes and the vanilla on the nose. And man, does it pack a punch. Because here's what I want to tell you. So when I said we have one American oak and four French oak, why do you think we only have one American oak? What did, what did you say? He said, you don't want more than one in a barrel. Well, think about it. The whiskey has already been aged. It's already been matured in American oak barrel. So when you add more American oak to it, what do you get? You get more American oak, unless you cook it for a long period of time at a low temperature. Now, as our old master distiller taught me, he said, American oak, Jacqueline, it's like Americans. It's big, it's bold, it's loud. You know it's whiskey when you drink it. So I will tell you, uh, when it comes time to drink our private select, there are three of those bad boys in that barrel, um, which I think is going to be really tasty. So um, our next one would be our seared French cuvee stave because we get real fancy when we go to France. Is, uh, is cuvee, is that French? Oh, yes. It is French for blend of uh, we've flavor. We've been practicing that for a week now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was Spanish about an hour ago. I didn't know. <laughs> For a blend of flavor. And the cool thing about the cuvee staves is it's got these ripples cut into it. It's kind of like a Ruffles potato chip is what it looks like. And what that does is it gives it more surface area when it's in the barrel. So you get more wood to whiskey interaction with that particular stave. It's also French oak. So unlike American oak, it's a little bit more subtle. Um, it's a little bit more complex. You're going to get different nuanced flavors to it, and you're also going to get a lot longer finish with that as well. But the cool thing about this cuvee stave, and I've got a motto, it's called cuvee all day, is because it's just too damn good. When you taste it, how many of you all are put creamer in your coffee? Remember, oh, yeah, yeah. Y'all going to like this cuvee stave? If you cook with real butter at home, if you like full fat whipping cream, if you pick a ribeye over a filet, you're gonna love cuvee, all right? It is rich, it is creamy, it is delicious. So we're gonna pick that, that's our mystery. So this is our mystery. And what this is, this is a component of the Private Select program. There's five different staves to choose from. And what we did is we took a barrel of Maker's Mark and we put 10 of just the cuvee stave in there so you can really get an exaggerated idea how that particular stave interacts with our whiskey. Now, when you nose it, it's a little bit more subtle on the nose, a little bit more delicate. Now, let's taste it. Cheers. Cuvee. That's a fun word to say. Mm-hmm. Huh? Wee-wee. Mm -hmm. oui, oui. It's a fun word to drink, too. All right. Woo. What do you think about that French? Is that good? Is it? Did you? You may have said this and I missed it. Is this ever going to be for sale? No. This is all inside this baseball. Is, now I never say never, but we don't plan to sell this. I, 
There's no plan to sell this on its own. This is a component. So this is an example of a stave that you can put in your barrel. So when the big bourbon club came and did their private select, they tasted through the five uh, flavors or the five samples, like the cuvee, the P2, uh, the Mondiant, and so on and so forth. And the idea there is that before they leave, they have to select a combination of 10 staves to go in their barrel to create a very unique flavor profile. And there's over a thousand possibilities, but it's a really cool way to drive flavor. All right, I see a question. Scott sent a... This is 110.2, right? So good. It's like an after dinner drink, isn't it? What do y'all get? What do y'all get from the the cuvee? It's a fun word to say. <laughs> it's yeah. It's got a very delicate. Would everybody be quiet? My son's trying to talk. No, I'm just joking. We heard the question. We heard the question. He was talking about how the nose was just so different compared to the other uh, bourbons, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. Ooh, much more elegant. Ooh. Like like oh, it's delicious. So um, I'm going to take over just for a second, if you don't mind. So let me do this. Let me, uh, let me thank our sponsors. I didn't go there. Let me thank our sponsors. So Blue and Company, uh, our CPA accounting firm sponsor, Doug Wise, my good friend, his mother passed away yesterday, so God rest her soul. He's not here, but thank you for Blue and Company. Whiskey Grail, Bourbon City Cruisers, Sean Higgins uh, with Mint Julep Tours and Bourbon City, Bourbon City Cruisers, Wesley's Wicks, Element 502, Bourbon Women, Charles Rene, who's behind us with underproduction, He's the fellow that put this whole thing together and is streaming it out live to the rest of the world on Facebook and the Fraser Museum. So thanks for all of our sponsors. We appreciate it. Uh, one other thing I didn't mention. So first of all, if you're a lady, stand up. Just the ladies. I, if you identify, you can just come on. Okay. L look at this. This is not your father's bourbon club. This is, come on. If, if this is marketing 101, bring in the pretty ladies and the guys follow, right? Join the damn club. Look at this. Um, I forgot what I was going to say next. I got so nervous. Also, Top Shelf. If you're a Top Shelf member, I didn't mention it, but Chris asked me to say this real loud, but you get a 25% discount at Joe's all the time, right, Chris? So thank you for that. If you join tonight, you're going to pay for your dinner and your drinks. So join now. 25% off at Joe's all the time. All right. So thank you, Jacqueline. Let's go back. Let's ask some questions of Jacqueline about what we've had. Any other questions on the cuvee? Well, Ooh. you're going to, you're getting ready to get that. It's coming. We're not coming yet, but it's coming. <laughs> the bottle is right here. The private select. Steve. That's our bottle. How do they get this bottle? Oh, how do you get the bottle? I was actually going to say that in a second, but thank you for pimping me. Excuse me for present <laughs> for setting me up. Sorry. Um, also, hey, Charles Renee. So Charles calls me this morning and says, hey, Steve, do you have a logo of the Big Bourbon Club? I said, yeah, I got a logo. I got a vector file. And he said, send me your vector file. And he literally puts this thing together an hour before lunchtime. It's a slideshow with our, I'm like, man, we are up in our game. And this, where are you, Charles? Thank you for that. Thanks for doing it. <laughs> you know, it's a small thing, but it, but it helps. And so what we're going to do in April, Bill Reynolds at Element 502 is a friend, and he's a big Top Shelf member. We're going to be able to stream live, and, and we're going to get people out in the audience across the country. So when they ask questions, you'll see them on the TV. They'll see you, and, and the presenter will see with the TV here. It'll be very cool. So, Charles, thanks for all you're doing to come out on a after work on a busy Tuesday to make this happen. We appreciate it. Um, hey, Jack, go ahead.
Jack. You ask great questions. So uh, for those of you who Jack may not Jack and Jacqueline are brothers and sisters. They've been practicing. He just teased me up over here. He lobs them to me. Um, so the first question was about our Rick houses and the locations and how people will kind of move those around. Now, one thing that we do at Makers, we do a lot of things that are pretty unique, but probably the most in the industry is we hand rotate every single barrel from the top half of a warehouse down to the bottom. So what that means is, is when we enter our warehouses, all of our fresh made barrels with the distillate and the new barrel go straight to the tops of one of our warehouses. And they sit up top for approximately three Kentucky summers, so about three years. Then our warehouse crew does the painstaking process of hand rotating each one of those barrels from the top down to the bottom. So let's imagine, if you will, we have a six story warehouse. Row six goes down to row one, row five goes to two, three and four, they actually stay where they're at because they're right there in the middle and they get the best of both worlds. And the reason that we do that, we do it for three reasons. Number one, we're crazy. It's true, we are control freaks at Maker's Mark. Um, and when you only make one thing, and that's the thing, when you get hired on, Bill or Rob or whoever pulls you into the office and they, they say one thing, you got one job, don't fuck it up. <laughs> that's what they tell you. And the truth is, when you only make one thing, you can't afford to what? That's right. So, we rotate because consistency, right? So, none of our warehouses are climate controlled. So, at the top of the warehouse, it's much warmer than the bottom of the warehouse. You're going to get a lot more wood to whiskey interaction up top. We don't want that to become overly oaked. So, what we do is we move those barrels down to the bottom floors for the rest of their maturation process. And we're going to slow that maturation process down, allow some of those other flavors to marry and meld together. We don't become bitter. We just kind of slow that process down. And it also gives um, that whiskey time to interact with all the different temperatures. So you're going to get a more consistent flavor profile out of that. So, in a sense, yes, we do rotate in that we literally rotate every single warehouse. Yes. Oh, wow. Rachel, Rachel over here, she said, how much do the barrels weigh and how many people does it take to move it? Well, when we rotate and we enter and we take out barrels of our warehouse, we do it in about teams of seven or eight. Um, and there's only one person rolling them at a time. They're kind of passing them along, and they weigh 525 pounds when they are full. So they're really strong. And your second question was? The oh, the cave, yes, the cave. Otherwise known as the cellar, uh, because it was a funny story. Um, a few years, oh, it's been, gosh, it's been, this is probably 2014. Um, Bill Jr. was hanging around in the parking lot. And Bill Jr., he's, you know, Steve worked for him for a while. He knows he's, he's a bit of a character. And he's 80 years old, and, you know, he's just staring at a hillside. And I thought, oh, God, he's finally lost it. Anyway, so I walk up to him, and I'm like, hey, Bill, what's going on? He goes, I got an idea. I said, oh, really? <laughs> he said, we got to figure out a way to make 46 year round. And we can only produce it in the winter time right now. We need a place where it's gonna be cold year round. And I said, okay, well, what's your plan? He said, we're gonna stick some dynamite in that hillside right there. And we're gonna build a cave. And I laughed and I patted him on the back and I walked off and shook my head. And I thought that man has lost it. Fast forward a couple years later, I'm with a group, and I hear boom, and the ground is shaking. And I thought, holy shit, he's done it. Uh, so we did it. We stuck some dynamite in the hillside, uh, limestone hillside. Originally, we wanted a cave. Turns out 
it's a bit tricky. So we ended up with the cellar about 40 feet into the into the <laughs> hillside there. You gotta you gotta remember on top of our hillside is our water source. So we didn't want to dynamite too much around there. Uh, but we do. We call it the cellar. But it is, it's kind of like a bat cave. It's really cool, literally and figuratively. So if you come, it's the, the 50 degrees or lower. And that's where we make all of our private select and 46. How, may, uh, how often does Bill get out to Loretto to the now? Too much. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Bill is retired. Um, but he's always the first one in the office in the mornings in Louisville, and he can give a hell of a tour, and he does it quite often. He comes to Loretto quite a bit, so, yeah. Any questions as we head into the, um, the final stretch? I've got a question on Facebook here. Let me get back. A lot of Cuvée questions. I think they just want to hear me say it. <laughs> Cuvée is a type of wine, Mary Roller said. Did you know that? Indeed, it's like a blended wine, I believe. Is it a box or is it a, never mind. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Is Cuvée available through the Maker's Ambassador or other subscription program? No, the only way to try Cuvée, if you were here tonight or if you buy a barrel at Maker's Mark, you get to try it in that process. You're selling barrels of it? Not bar Well, if you wanted to do a barrel of all 10 Cuvée staves, you could. I guess we could have, right? Mm-hmm. All right, let me see. I think I've got one more here. Uh, you answered, why is it not for sale? Uh, would you send me a free sample? <laughs> Ooh, I'm jelly. Checks I don't know in the mail. <laughs> Ooh, I'm jelly. Those are dumb comments. We're done now with Facebook Live. I love it. Thank you, Facebook Suzanne. Live. Suzanne. Oh, for the 46? Mm -hmm. No, you did not. Um, so this was the packaging that Bill designed um, when he launched 46 um, in 2010. He wanted it to have a cork and just look a little bit more slender and just different. It's funny because we recently changed the packaging on Makers 46 to look more like our traditional packaging. Um, so it's more of a squared off bottle, uh, our new packaging for 46, same liquid, just different bottle. Um, but Bill always jokes, he said, you know, I had to, if you notice on the 46 bottle, his name is etched in the glass because he was afraid that when Rob took over, that's the first thing that would go was his name. <laughs> it has not, so. Scott Porter. Scott Tanner. You know, I guess you probably should. Yeah. It's a relic. What now? Yeah, they'll be shipping in two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Mike Davis? Oh, gosh. 10% mm, maybe? What portion of sales, total sales, are 46? I, and I said 10. What did you say? 100,000 boxes, okay, cases versus, yeah. So, yeah, under 10%. <laughs> so, where does, yeah. where does make the traditional makers that we've all known for decades, where does it stand globally in terms of sales relative to a other large Jim Beam brands or other big right. global brands? I don't know the exact numbers. I can tell you that, like, Jim Beam, for example, way more sales um also you know jack daniels number one selling whiskey in the world um is it a bourbon i didn't ask you all okay jacqueline's not going to answer a lot of people think it is a bourbon jack is it a bourbon it's not a bourbon okay it's controversial mm -hmm. that lincoln county process it'll get you You know, we've asked that question quite a bit, and we're going to keep the IV just to kind of pay homage to the founders. Keep it that way. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions before we get to the 
Delicious Private Select. Woo -woo. So raise your hand if you if you have a uh, Private Selection barrel that we that we purchased, Big Bourbon Club. Raise your hand high. Wow, there's a, Chris. There's a lot of potential left in this room. Do not let them out until they get a bottle. Raise your. I will tell you this, that it is without a doubt my all-time favorite maker's expression that I've ever had. The other one would have been the DNA Project 120 proof, oh. which I love. We did a cool thing with Thomas Bolton here, but this is really good. So, all right. All right, y'all ready for this? The fourth, the delicious Big Bourbon Club private selection. Joe's older than dirt. Came to the distillery and created something fabulous. Oh, thank you. Came to the distillery and created something fabulous. And it's funny because when I was called and asked to come do this tonight, the first thing I did is I looked up the stave combination. And before I even ta tasted the whiskey, I knew I was going to like it. Simply because of the staves that you all chose. Um, and quite frankly, I've, I've, I've done these barrel... Uh, since it began and I've done a lot of groups and had a lot of different stave combinations and this one's pretty unique I have to say um, and this one is very indicative of a group of people who have very good solid bourbon palates yes and I'll tell you how I know that to be because right out of the gate there are three of that P2 stave that I told you that was that America is going to kick your ass stave. And it's delicious. And it brings those nice honey notes, those caramel notes, um, a lot of vanilla. But it gives you that nice warm sensation whenever you drink it. So in this barrel, there were three of the baked American Pure 2 staves used. There were three of that glorious cuvee stave that you all tried earlier. So if you liked that whiskey, you're probably going to like this one because that cuvee is an alpha stave. A little bit goes a long way. There is one of the 46 because it's just too damn good not to. There is one of something called the roasted French Mondiant stave. And this roasted French Mondiant stave, that's just a very fancy French term for a bit of chocolate that has dried fruits and nuts dropped into it. But you're going to get those rich, creamy, kind of milk chocolate flavors from this. Additionally, and again, this is how I knew I was dealing with some good advanced palates. There are two of the spice stave in this one. And the way I describe the spice stave, have you ever chewed big red chewing gum? You know, that cinnamon clove flavor you get with it. And if you like old fashions, you're going to like that spice stave. So, y'all ready? Hold on. Hey, hold. everybody quiet in the back. Last one. Yeah, it's, it's really loud up here. Thank you. So let me ask a question real quick before, we, before you sip on this or sip on it if you like. So far, give me a, a show of hands. Give me uh, the first expression was the cask strength. If that was your favorite, raise your hand high. Not too many of us. Uh, if the 46 is your favorite, raise your hand high. More of the 46. No, Cuvée was three, right? Yeah, and if Cuvée was your favorite, raise your hand. Actually, I'd say 46 may have more than Cuvée. Watch this, watch this tidal wave here. Oh, yeah. All right, let's oh. try it. Well, just so you know, before you sip it, this one, all private select comes out at cask strength. This one was bottled at 112.3. It's on the higher end. So bear that in mind. We're going to nose it first. 
Tell me what you smell. Hey, Tanner, you got to be an athlete to like this one. This may be tough for you. Yeah. <laughs> Eastern High ain't going to get it done, bro. <laughs> Does anyone get those uh, honeysuckle notes on there? Oh, yeah. A little bit of vanilla. Ooh, smells good. All right. Chestnut? Chestnut? Dried, fruit. Dried fruit, absolutely. He's just some apricots. And so ra and raise your hand if you're an, an executive uh, bourbon steward. I know we have at least two. Danielle, Ed, Who any, else? any executive bourbon stewards? I know of you two. Anybody else? I don't want to put you on the spot, but what do you all get off of this pick? Ooh, brown sugar sweetness. Yeah. Danielle, anything? Buttery. Yep. Ooh. What about you, Whiskey Biscuit? I see you in the back. Well, who's Whiskey Biscuit? Whiskey Biscuit, stand up. Oh, my goodness. I Come love on, that name. <laughs> he just bought a <laughs> bottle. <laughs> Whiskey Biscuit. I think you can do that with Kentucky Liquor Laws. <laughs> Buy your own bottle and start drinking it out. Hell yeah, you can. <laughs> His name's Whiskey Biscuit. He can do whatever the hell he wants. <laughs> That's funny. I love it. Well, what did you all think of that? Good? Cheers. All right, so we've already seen the first three. You can change your vote right now. Mm. Raise your hand if the barrel pick that we did would be your favorite, for real. That is good. Hey, Crest, here they come. That is really good. It is so delicious. That's like toasted caramel marshmallow just deliciousness. It's Jacqueline, good. Jacqueline, what do you think? You're a pro at this. I think it's yeah, it's just good. It's creamy. It's rich. It's it's good. Mike, Mike Beam, what do you think? Yeah, As you all did like six iterations. Yeah. So well, this I, I is just really want to tell you, Jacqueline, the louder it gets, the more fun they're starting to have. <laughs> That's good. That's what they're supposed to I be having. I think they are having fun. Any questions right now? Uh, Jeff. <laughs> We've got a secondary sale going on. All right. You already got secondary going. All right. We like that. Uh, anybody else? We're, we're all capitalists, but uh, any other questions? Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts, questions, concerns? All right. Let me see what we got here. Hey, Mike Beam, can I bring you up for a sec? Come on up, Mike Beam. So first of all, come on up here. So let me, let me thank our good friend Mike Beam, because Mike has not only made Makers happen tonight with Jacqueline in this entire event, but he's helped us with Jim Beam back in November. And uh, anyway, tell him a little bit about your family history, because it's fascinating if you're a bourbon fan, if you don't mind. Not today. Huh? <laughs> come on. Uh, so, I'm an eighth generation Beam, so meaning if you look at a bottle of Jim Beam and you start at Jacob, I'm an eighth generation uh, down from there. Uh, so currently, Fred at Jim Beam would be the seventh, his son Freddie would be the eighth, so it gives you a kind of idea of where we're at with that. Um, but I grew up in Pennsylvania, uh, my dad was a banker, and when I was going to college, I came down and had my grandmother take me on my first bourbon tour. And it was at Maker's Mark in 2002. So a long, long time ago. Maker's Mark. How many people have been to Maker's Mark? In the last caught 10 years. Okay. So if you went 20 years ago, the gift shop was no bigger than this room. It is where the restaurant currently sits now. And we're walking through. We're getting ready to start my tour. And my grandmother starts poking me and I'm like what grandma you know we're getting ready to start and she says well that's my brother-in-law <laughs> and I'm like oh shit well the guy in the front hears this and says excuse me ma'am did you just say what I think you said she says yes Elmo Beam was my brother-in-law as Jacqueline said he was the first master dis distiller and she points uh, at him and says yeah I remember uh, the day he came home after you know, started working here. 
Now, Elmo died uh, about two or three years in, so he never actually tasted the product that he created. Um, but what was so unique about that was on this tour, the, the tour guide, every time we stopped at a section, he would look back and say, Ms. Beam, do you have anything to add? And, <laughs> and she would add her two cents, and my grandmother could add her two cents. And the reason we all know she could add her two cents, she was married to a master distiller for 50 years, and she drank three times in her life. That we know of. They were all at weddings, and she had to get carried out all of them. <laughs> Michael, thank you for everything. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. And thanks for jumping up uh, impromptu. That's a French word that I just learned. Impromptu. <laughs> It could be Spanish. I don't know what the hell it is. Hey, I got a quick question. Yes. Got a quick question for okay. Facebook Live. B Corporation certification. What does that mean? Well, um, it means a lot of things. Um, in order to become a B Corp certified, um, they look at how you contribute to the local community, how you treat your employees, how you interact with the environment, sustainability. Um, so there were a lot of initiatives that we do at Maker's Mark and have been doing for several years that help us achieve this B Corp status. Um, and it's, it's a pretty hard, rigorous uh, certification to achieve as a company. Um, and just to give you just, just a very small kind of overview of some of the things that we've done, um, it'd take me all night to talk about it, but... You know, for instance, if you come to our distillery, you might notice some of our pathways because we are expanding, hopefully, in the future where you'll get to go and you'll get to take hikes of our distillery. We own over 1,600 acres now of farmland, and it's beautiful, and we want people to go out and experience it. But our pathways are going to be um, pulverized bottles. Um, we will be zero waste by 2023. Um, we, um, obviously we've got our water sanctuary with our lake. It's the largest water sanctuary in North America currently. Um, so yeah, so in just trying to get as many of our, um, resources locally, uh, so that we reduce our footprint. We're just doing a lot of things, uh, eliminating plastic usage, all these wonderful things and also how we treat our employees, um, you know, for instance, if you work at Maker's Mark and you have to go on maternity leave, you can have up to six months of maternity leave. Um, yeah, which I think is really, really great. Um, so there's a lot of things that we do and, and how we give back to the community and the millions of dollars that we've donated over the years to charities um, that have helped us achieve this status. And we're just going to keep doing more and more. All right, that's awesome. Thank you. Last chance, any questions, any comments, any concerns, any thoughts, any pissed off customers? Yeah, I think it's a question of concern, not a pissed off customer. Yeah, good man. 1979. 1979. So, Jacqueline, thank you so much for coming out on a Tuesday night and sharing with us. Well, thank you. Awesome. It's an honor. Before I go. Yes, ma'am. I want to pick on Hilda. Come here real quick. I got something for you, girl. I, I was, was very. I was going to call Hilda up. Listen, I was super inspired by you <laughs> because it's true. As a woman in the industry, I can tell you a lot of times you go to these things. And it is a bunch of old white guys. It really is. So it's Fif nice to on, see women. Hold on, 59's not old. <laughs> it's, relative. it's all relative speaking. So, but because you're here and because it's International Women's Day and I was really inspired by you, I'm sorry I don't have enough for everybody, but I want to give you something special. So this is a lapel pin of Margie Samuels, and what does it say? I am woman, hear me pour. I love it. I love yes, it. Yes, ma'am. 
You Greg. get to pour it, Hilda. <laughs> Thank you all. You are a delight. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Jack. And give her a big hand. I, I don't want to forget, but make sure, make sure you not only pay your waitress. Carter, wave your hand so they can see you. You've got to pay Carter, but tip her really, really well. They've done a great job with a really big crowd. Crest, thank you for a great job for closing off this whole section, awesome job. And I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. My son is a financial advisor. Tonight only for 70 basis points, he will manage all of your portfolio. <laughs> I'm just joking, he better charge 100 basis points or he ain't managing your money. All right, hey, April 12th, April 12th is our next event. It's the second, we go second Tuesday in the spring and the fall. In the summer, we go on Saturdays, all right? Second Tuesday of April is the 12th. Ezra Brooks is the pick that we will release, and Lux Row is the distiller, and we'll get Jacqueline's counterpart to come out. I think actually the master distiller is. We're getting ready to get that confirmed. And then we have Peerless coming out in May. So thank you. If you want to get a bottle, go see Cress. Thanks for everybody. Good night.